Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Bereans Bible Institute. I'm Pastor Tim Warner, your teacher. Um, last time we talked about the uh, sign of Jonah, um, the fact that Jesus said that he would be, uh, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, in the same way the Son of Man would be in the heart of the land for three days and three nights. And we showed how the correct interpretation of that refers to Jesus being in a state of grief and anguish over the city of Jerusalem and its coming destruction, and that he preached and prophesied the destruction of Jerusalem, just as Jonah preached and prophesied the destruction of Nineveh in 40 days um, when he was um, sent there by God to preach that message as well. So the sign of Jonah did not have to do with Christ being in the tomb. It had to do with his uh, preaching concerning the destruction, the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem, which incidentally took place 40 years after Jesus prophesied that, which is a parallel to the 40 days of Jonah's prophecy. Now, we come to some uh, significant events also that occurred in that week leading up to the first Passover. I want you, if you would please, take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 6. I'm sorry, chapter 12, not 6. <clears throat> in John 12, um, we have an interesting account of something that occurred the night before um, Jesus' first statement about the destruction of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Let's read it in uh, verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now, putting um, ointment, oils, spices, fragrances, perfumes, um, anointing someone like that was a practice that the Jews did for burial. In fact, we see later in the Gospels after Jesus was crucified that the women came and they brought spices and oils and so forth and they were anointing his dead body um, as they were uh, wrapping him in, in cloth and so forth. Um, so we see now Mary, six days before the Passover, Mary at this meal is, you know, breaks open this um, very expensive oil and is anointing Jesus' feet and wipes his feet with her hair. Now look what happens. It says in verse 4 that one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, quote, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now, I've told you before that John's Gospel in particular, in particularly, oftentimes adds sort of a commentary rather than just reporting the news of what occurred or a dialogue that was happening, that John very frequently adds little comments here and there as by way of uh, explanation. And that's what we have here. In beginning of verse 6, he says, This he said, that is, Judas said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Now, the money box that he had was the treasury. That was the, um, you know, the savings account, if you will, or the uh, petty cash um, that Jesus had uh, for his ministry, because obviously they had a lot of expenses as they went from place to place. And so Judas was the treasurer, and he used to pilfer from the treasury, and he didn't care for the poor. He was he had ulterior motives for that. He wanted to pilfer some of this money. Apparently, he was supposedly giving to the poor, and instead of giving it to the poor, he was actually taking it for himself. But look what Jesus says to Judas here. G Judas pretends to rebuke Mary for this gracious act that she, she did, which he thought was extravagant. But Jesus turns around, and now he rebukes Judas. But Jesus said, Let her alone. She has kept this 
for the day of my burial. That is, she has been holding on to these, this expensive oil for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Now, remember, this is, this is at a supper. This occurred at a supper that was convened for the purpose of people coming and seeing Jesus in person and seeing him sitting there across the table from Lazarus, the man that he had raised from the dead. And this was, you know, it was a bit of a show um, for people to come and, and see this man, Lazarus. You know, Lazarus was from Bethany, and here Jesus comes to Bethany, and so they're seeing them together there. People came around. Look what it says in the next verse. This is now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, who he had raised from the dead. So news had gotten around that Jesus had raised this man from the dead, and it was causing a lot of trouble for the chief priests um, at the temple. The next verse says, But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. Of course, now, if you continue reading in this chapter, we have the account of the um, Jesus riding down the donkey um, on Palm Sunday, where he first began to prophesy the destruction of Jerusalem. That occurred the next day, which was Sunday. Now, I want you to <coughs> go in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to see what happened on the evening of the third day that Jesus had been prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem, which would have been a Tuesday, three days after Palm Sunday. So go to Matthew chapter uh, 26 for just a minute. <clears throat> and let's start. take a look at uh, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these sayings, and by the way, these sayings here is a reference to the Olivet Discourse, where he um, gave told, told his disciples on that Tuesday night of the coming signs of his coming in the end of the age. Um, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered to be crucified. So this, this verse tells us the time sequence. This tells us that the Olivet Discourse was delivered on a Tuesday night, which on the Jewish calendar would be the beginning of Wednesday, and uh, that two days later was the Passover, which, um, which is when Jesus would be crucified. All right, then it's, it says, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at a place of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. Now, this is on Tuesday night. But they said, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper... Now, remember, the previous meal that was described in John chapter 12 probably was at the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, because they were all three there at the time, and people were coming to see Lazarus and so forth. Now, here we are... That was on a Saturday. Here we are, after the three day, the intervening three days where Jesus was weeping and crying over Jerusalem and prophesying his destruction. At the end of that period of time, there's another feast. So that period of three days and three nights where Jesus was prophesying the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem is sort of, uh, it had, there are bookends <laughs> to that period of three days and three nights. And those two bookends are these two feasts, these two suppers where Jesus was invited along with a series of guests. The first one at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And at the end of that three days and three nights, it's at the house of Simon the leper. And what's fascinating about this is a very similar incident took place at this second feast as well. Look at this. Um, it says, verse 6, and, and when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, same town as the first feast, a woman came to him having an alabaster flax of very costly fragrant oil. And she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. Now, a lot of people, 
mistakenly believe that this is the same incident that was recorded in John 12, but it's clearly not. This incident took place two days before the Passover. The other incident took place six days before the Passover. So clearly they're not the same incident. But a almost identical situation develops. Look at what he says. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why the waste? Now, do you remember in, the, in John 12, the first time when Mary did this, she, she anointed Jesus' feet. Here, this woman, who's not named, is anointing Jesus' head. The first time, Judas Iscariot only objected to the, um, the use of this costly oil. And in this case, his disciples, plural, are objecting. They seem to be. They seem to have been inf influenced by Judas's previous objection at the feast that was three days and three nights earlier. But look what happens. They said something very similar to what Judas said. For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Now, he's saying the same thing essentially that he said about Mary anointing his feet. He's saying that about this woman who anoints his head, that she's anointing me for my burial. Now, this is the second time that this has happened. Verse 13. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. Now, remember, this is two days before the Passover. And look what it says next. Verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, now what time? Right after supper. Right after supper, two days before the Passover, Judas left the house where this meal was being served, where people were uh, coming to um, eat with Jesus. And he went to confer with the chief priests and in order to purchase this betrayal. Um, or to um, get money for betraying Jesus. Now, the next verse talks about um, the first day of unleavened bread, uh, eating the Passover, and so forth, which happened two days later. Now, what I want to do is I want to go to Luke's account and show you um, what Luke says about Judas' betrayal and when this occurred. Go to Luke chapter um, 22. Luke chapter 22 and verse 1. Now, the, the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. Now, notice he doesn't say the feast of unleavened bread that's called Passover arrived. He said it drew near. Now, this is similar to what Matthew says two days before the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Now look at verse 3. It's very important. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how they might betray, uh, betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. And then, of course, <clears throat> this account then skips down two days later to the time of the Passover and Jesus' meeting with his disciples there. The point I want you to see from Luke's account is that Satan entered into Judas. And at that moment, Judas then went out and conferred with the scribes and the Pharisees <clears throat> and agreed to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Remember back in Matthew, <clears throat> it says that um, 
it was during the meal, or was or at the end of the meal, apparently, of um, at the house of Simon, that one of the twelve, verse, uh, chapter twenty-six, verse fourteen of Matthew says, "Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me, and I will deliver him to you?'" And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. From that time, he sought to, opportunity to betray him. Luke's gospel says that Satan entered into him, and then he went out and conferred with the chief priests and scribes and made this agreement. All right, now this this is a very important uh, point. I want you to now go to John chapter 13. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> John chapter 13. I think you're going to see something rather surprising in John's account of this. Most of you... And, and I have to say me as well. I have most of my Christian life, up until very recently, I have believed and I have taught that John chapters, <clears throat> excuse me, John chapters 13 through 15, 16 rather, what is commonly referred to as the upper room discourse, that this occurred on the evening that Jesus ate the Passover with his disciples. And that's what I've always thought. Um, there's some reasons why. I won't get into those now. But it has bothered me from time to time as I've read these things to see so many things recorded in John 13, 14, 15, and 16 that are not found in the other three Gospels with regard to the Passover. And in John's account, the Passover is... Him eating the Passover and, you know, t instituting communion, you know, this is my body, this is my blood, <clears throat> all that. We don't see any of that in John's account. There's no mention of, of any of the Passover elements being eaten at this meal in John's account. We see them in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not in John. What I'm going to show you now is that Matt, or, excuse me, that John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16 does not take place during the Passover. It takes place two days earlier at the supper that was given at the house of Simon the leper that we just read about in Matthew chapter 26 <clears throat> and also in Luke. It is the meal where Judas left the meal when Satan entered into him and he went to confer with the scribes and Pharisees to sell Jesus to them, basically, for 30 pieces of silver. Let's look at John 13, verse 1. Notice the language carefully. It says, now before the feast of the Passover. Does it say at the feast of the Passover? No. It says before the feast of the Passover. When Jesus knew that his hour had come that he should depart from the world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, and supper being ended. Now, all of those, <clears throat> all those statements there, that is, when Jesus knew his hour had come, when he should depart from the world, having loved his own, and supper being ended, all those things occur before the feast of the Passover in verse 1. Look at the text again. He said, before the feast of the Passover, then he lists all these things that occurred before the feast of the Passover. <clears throat> and they are, Jesus knew his hour had come, he had loved his own to the end, and supper had ended. Therefore, I submit to you that supper here is not the Passover supper. This is the meal that was served two days before the Passover. Let's continue reading. It says, And supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and they had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. Now, <clears throat> this is, of course, where he washes the disciples' feet. Not at the Passover meal. He washes the disciples' feet at the house of Simon the leper. Now, it says here that Judas, that uh, Satan had already 
put it into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. But something happened at this meal that pushed Judas over the edge to where he actually acted upon what had been planted in his heart, that is to betray Jesus. And what do you think that was? I want you to tell me. What do you think it was? Since John says that Judas, Satan had already placed it into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. At this time, at this meal, something happened. What was that? Pushed him over the edge. Well, those of you who said it was Jesus' rebuke about concerning the ointment that was uh, placed on him and his rebuke of his disciples, uh, that's correct. See, Judas is the guy who first brought that, con that, uh, that concept up. And Jesus rebuked Judas a few days earlier. And now when his disciples say essentially the same thing, Jesus rebukes them as well. So this was another slap to Judas because um, the other disciples were simply going along with what Judas had said earlier. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to read this part about uh, him washing the disciples' feet and all that, but I want to skip down to um, verse, verse 18. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the Scripture may be fulfilled... Uh, actually, excuse me. I should have I should have started in verse eleven. Go back to verse eleven. <clears throat> For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, "You are not all clean." So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, he sat down, and, and then he goes on to um, talk about what he had done to them. Now, he comes back to this point in verse eighteen. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. That's in uh, Psalm 41, verse 9. He's quoting that. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it comes to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. When Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, hes you can see the intensity of these statements about um, him being betrayed. Remember, this is two days before the Passover. This is not at the Passover. After he washes their feet and he says, you know, I know whom I have chosen, but one of you is not clean. And now he's saying it intently. One of you is going to betray me. Look at verse 22. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And this, of course, was John, um, the one who wrote this uh, gospel. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was um, of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? This, uh, this is something that probably was a very uh, quiet and uh, private conversation between John and Jesus. Jesus answered, It is he to whom I give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, look at verse 27. This is important. It says, Now after the piece of bread. This is during the meal. This is towards the end of the meal. After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. After the piece of bread Satan entered him now when did Luke's gospel say say Satan entered him look back again at Luke 22 <clears throat> verse 3 then Satan entered Judas surnamed Iscariot who was numbered among the twelve now what happened when Satan entered Judas it says so he went his way, that is, he left and conferred with the chief priests and the captains how he might betray him to them. So Judas's first uh, conference, if you will, with the chief priests and scribes to come to an agreement on how he might betray Jesus and for what price took place 
at the time that Satan entered into, G into Judas. According to John's Gospel, Satan entered into Judas after Jesus gave him the piece of bread, after he had said, one of you is going to betray me. And according to Matthew's Gospel, in uh, Matthew chapter um, 26, go back there for just a moment, all of this took place at the house of Simon the leper. Look what it says again. It says, um, verse 26, verse 2, you know that after, excuse me, chapter 26, and verse 2, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, and the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery to, to kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, it talks about the woman, you know, uh, pouring the oil on his head and so forth. Um, um, in verse 14, after he rebukes them, the disciples, in verse 14 it says, Then one of them, at that time, one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me? So the conference with the chief priests, between Judas and the chief priests, where they made a deal for him to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, took place when Judas left the meal that was at the house of Simon the leper, according to Matthew's Gospel. According to Luke's Gospel, this is when Satan entered into Judas, and when Satan entered into Judas, he went to meet with them to confer to make this deal to betray him. And now, according to John's Gospel, John's Gospel puts this event in the middle of a feast, or the middle of a meal, a supper, that says very clearly in John 13, 1, that this was before the feast of the Passover, that it was not, it was not the Passover. It was before the feast of the Passover. Look again at John 13, 27. It says, Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. Then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. Now, what was Jesus saying to him? Jesus knew that he was going to betray him. Jesus had said that someone is going to be, one of you is going to betray me. And now Satan enters into Judas. And as soon as Satan entered into Judas, what happens? After the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, that is when Satan has entered him, he says, what you do, do quickly. What, what was he going to do? He was leaving the supper to go confer with the scribes and the Pharisees to make this deal to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Now look at verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. Now, <clears throat> notice, <coughs> if this was the Passover meal, why would Jesus be sending Judas out to buy something for the feast? He would buy something for the feast before the feast, not after the feast, right? So it's evident, it's, it's very clear here that when it says that um, they thought Jesus was telling him that when he left, you know, what you do, do quickly. He was going to buy something for the Passover that was coming up in two days. Not that the Passover was there right now during this time. Verse 30. Having the, received the piece of bread, he went out immediately and it was night. This is the supper. And he went out to, again, to confer with the Scribes and the uh, the uh, scribes and the chief priests who betrayed Jesus. Verse thirty one. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, "Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in Him. If God is glorified in Him, God will also glorify Him in Himself and glorify Him immediately." Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. <clears throat> We're not going to go into the rest of this. This um, you all know the upper, what's called the upper room discourse, which obviously was not in the upper room, but was at the house of Simon. Um, you can read that 
um, if you want to, all the way through um, the end of chapter 16, is a continuation <coughs> of that discussion. Now, I want to go to, I want to talk about the Passover, which occurred uh, two days later when Judas actually did betray Jesus that night. Let's take our Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 26. <coughs> Matthew 26 and uh, verse 17. Remember, in verse, in verse uh, 16, it leaves off with Judas leaving um, the dinner two days earlier to um, look for an opportunity. You know, he sought an opportunity to betray him and so forth. Verse 17. Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus, did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now, evening, of course, the, Pas the Passover lamb was to be killed um, just before sundown, or just at actually right after sundown, while it was still twilight. And the meal was to be prepared during the twilight hours. And then after dark, the Passover meal was to be eaten. And so that's what we have here now. This is on, a, this is on Thursday night, two days after <clears throat> the Tuesday night meal that they had um, where um, Judas uh, left the meal and so forth that we read about in uh, John. All right, so he says, um, now... At, at, um, Verse 20, when evening had come, he sat down with the 12. Now notice it says he sat down with the 12, not he sat down with the 11. Judas got up and left the meal two days earlier to make a deal to betray Jesus. Here we are two days later at the Passover, and guess who shows up? Judas. As though everything is fine, even though in his heart he is seeking a way to betray Jesus, and he's already made a deal to turn him over to them. He is part of this twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, I, uh, Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. <laughs> he says it again. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each one began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as, as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. You know, Judas sure, sure was warned plenty of times, wasn't he? He was warned. I mean, Jesus Jesus repeatedly said that one of, one of you is going to betray me. He said it two days earlier, and here he is saying it again. <clears throat> Verse 25. Then Judas, who was betraying him, notice the verb tense there. He was in the process of betraying him answered and said rabbi is it i and he said to him you have said it and as they were eating jesus took bread blessed and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said take eat this is my body then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you all of you not 11 of you all of you did Judas take communion with Jesus and the other 11 disciples? Did he? You could infer that from Matthew's account. Although Matthew doesn't specifically say, I mean, you, you could say, well, Judas got up and left um, just before Jesus took bread and blessed it and gave it to his disciples. You could say that. In fact, I was in a class one time where that's exactly what they said. That Judas was not present, and the reason they said that was that, you know, Je Jesus would never allow an apostate uh, to be, you know, to partake uh, with him of, of the uh, the Passover meal. But that's not true. I want to show you what what happened here. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Luke's Gospel here, Luke twenty two. <clears throat> Luke twenty two verse. Fourteen. When the hour had come, and that's the time of the Passover, he sat down with the twelve apostles with him. 
Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Did that include Judas? Yes, because it says the twelve. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, and this, this would have been the third cup, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, was Judas there? Did Judas partake of the bread? Did Judas partake of the cup? Yes, look at the next verse. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. That's what Jesus said as he took the cup. After he had passed the bread around, and they all partook of the bread, he passed the cup around, and they all partook of the cup, including Judas. And Jesus said, Behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. Wow. Wow. You know, we take communion every Sunday. But it's possible. It's possible that when we do that, that we have a Judas in our midst. It, when Christians take communion all over the world as Jesus' sheep, as his disciples, it's very possible that there are Judas Iscariots in their midst, partaking of communion, that are so, what's the word? They're so good at pretending to be a true follower of Christ, that even after they have given in to betraying Christ, even after Satan has entered into them to betray Christ, they can sit there, and pretend that everything is fine, that they are one of Christ's sheep, that they can take communion. Here, Judas took communion right there in the presence of Jesus, while both of them knew, while they looked each other in the eye, Jesus having said, one of you is going to betray me, and having even identified to Judas that it was him when he said, Lord, is it I? And they could look across the table at one another, and Judas could take that bread, and put it in his mouth after Jesus said, this is my body which is broken for you. And then he could take that cup and drink of it along with the other 12 disciples when Jesus said, this is my blood which is given for you, knowing full well that he's the one who's going to turn him over and cause his blood to be shed. Wow. Wow. This is, this is something that is, is unthinkable that anyone could be so callous that they could do that. But it, it happened in the case of Judas, and it happens today in the case of other people as well. Now let's continue reading. <clears throat> uh, let's go down to verse um, 28. Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials. Now, when he said that, he means in contrast to this one who is betraying me, who's in the process of betraying me. He's saying, the rest of you have continued with me, even in these hardships, even in my trials. And so what does he say? And I bestow upon you a kingdom. The, the word in the Greek here does not really mean bestow. The word means is, is actually the verb form of the noun, which is translated covenant. So literally, it would be saying, I am covenanting upon you or with you the kingdom, just as my father has covenanted with me. That's what the Greek says. That or so that, in order that, you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. You know, what he's saying essentially is, look, 
He he's been telling his disciples up to this point that he's going to be crucified, that he's going to rise again the third day. Now he's telling them that one of them is going to be his betrayer. He's he's said that at the previous supper. Now he's saying it at the last supper. But he's assuring. He's assuring his faithful disciples, the ones who stick with him, the ones who continue with him, that just as the Father has covenanted with him the kingdom, and of course this should bring to mind Psalm chapter two. What did what does Psalm two says? You know, here at Oasis we we talk about Psalm two quite a lot, probably to the point that some people think we're wearing it out. <clears throat> but we have the words of Christ there, where Jesus says that of what says what the father said to him you are my son today i have begotten you ask of me and i'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession you will shepherd them with a rod of iron you will dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel and when we get to revelation chapter 20 i'm sorry uh chapter 2 i believe it is when jesus is talking about those who overcome he who overcomes, he says, he will allow to sit with him his, in his throne as he has overcome and has sat down with the Father in his throne. That is to reign with Christ. In another one of the, of the letters, the seven letters there, he says, uh, the, one, the one who overcomes, that um, he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. He's essentially taking Psalm 2 and saying that, you know, I'm going to allow you to share in my reigning over the earth according to psalm chapter 2 of what the father promised me i'm gonna i'm gonna allow you to share in that and this passage right here in verse 28 in luke chapter 22 verse 28 29 and 30 are saying essentially the same thing to jesus disciples that the father has covenanted this kingdom with him and that's a reference to psalm 2 and that those who continue with Christ in his trials, those who stick with him, those who don't become a Judas Iscariot, those who don't bail on Christ when the going gets tough, those who do not succumb to their desire for money or other things. Judas, you see, Judas's problem was that he loved money more than he loved Christ. You all may probably remember the parable of the sower where Jesus talked about how that uh, the sower went out and he sowed the word of God and some fell on the, the highway and Satan came and you know took the seeds away. And then some fell on um, thorny ground and the thorns came up and choked the word. And some fell on rocky ground. And when the sun came up and the persecution got tough, that some uh, fell away and so forth. But the ones that fell on, the seed that fell on the thorny ground it talks about how that other things and the cares of this world and materialism comes up and it chokes out the word and that these people then fall away well this is what happened to judas iscariot judas iscariot went from being one of the 12 from being one of the men that jesus said come follow me who left all to follow christ and because he was the treasurer and because he was handling the money, and because he had in his heart a lust for money and material things that he couldn't break free of, that thing ended up destroying him in the end. Satan used that weakness, that love for money and that love for materialism, Satan used that as a pry bar to get into Judas's mind and into Judas's conscience. It says, if you remember what we read earlier, it says Satan had put in his heart, in Judas's heart, to betray him. And then later, according to John's Gospel, it says that after Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me, and Jesus gave him the, the sop or the bread, the piece of bread, it then says that Satan then entered into Judas's heart, and he went out, and that's when he conferred with the scribes and Pharisees to... Um, to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You know, if nothing else, this, uh, this account of what happened to Judas ought to be a real warning to us as the followers of Christ. If we, don't, if we don't extinguish those little 
things in our life and in our minds that draw us away from Christ. Little That Satan can use those things to cause us to apostatize from him, to, to um, betray Christ. Throughout the epistles, the Bible talks about how that we are to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, that this is a process that we have to do. We have to, we can't just go along our merry way and think that everything is going to take care of itself. Holiness is a lifetime commitment. And it involves us taking care of, overcoming, one by one, overcoming all of those things in our life that, that draw us away from Christ. Because Satan is, is a master. He's a, he's a master at exploiting our weaknesses. And if we don't confront those weaknesses head on, and drive those things out of our lives. Satan will exploit them to the point where we may actually apostatize from Christ, just like Judas did. And look what happened to Judas in the end. Was he happy? Was he content with his 30 pieces of silver? No, he was sorrowful. I mean, we read after the crucifixion that he had all these regrets. And he went and he tried to give the money back. But it was too late, and so he cast the 30 pieces of silver into the temple. They wouldn't take the money back, uh, you know, the chief priests and scribes. They wouldn't do that. They, they weren't going to release Jesus if, you know, if he gave the money back. He couldn't undo what he did, and that's what apostasy is. See, when you reach a state of apostasy, there's no turning back. And Judas reached that point where there was no turning back. And because of that, what was left for Judas? He committed suicide death there was no more hope that's really sad but that's the end of those who do not conquer their for lack of a better term who do not conquer those demons that are are trying to draw them away from christ those things must be put down or we run the risk of satan exploiting them and ending up where judas ended up let's be careful about that all right. See you next time.